Hi there, and welcome to the developer experience set of videos I'm recording here on YouTube. Uh, as you remember, the last time we talked about creating a set of build pack images uh, using a combination of concourse for a continuous delivery um, and a plugin that builds OCI images using Docker files. Uh, so this is what we had before. We ended up with um, a standard build pack or build approach uh, across four different operating systems. So Red Hat, Debian, Bullseye, CC, and Ubuntu Jammy. And we took the base images for those um, operating systems. We applied a standard approach and standard version to running Flask and Python on those images so that we knew exactly the version of the runtime we were running in case there's a CVE release later on, so a critical vulnerability that we needed to patch. We know exactly that we're being consistent across all our images. And then we published, uh, we took a sample app with a very simple Flask application, um, which basically just publishes time. Um, this is the live version of that running. Uh, and then take that and publish the image. So there's four types of that image on top of each of the base operating systems there. So that's what we did last time. What I want to do today is talk you through something that I've just created, which is the part of uh, a future big demonstration. So there's a previous application I've got called ADSB. ADSB is kind of public information that's broadcast by large aircraft as they fly around the world. So if you've got a little Raspberry Pi with a software defined radio on it, you can actually intercept these. So if you've ever seen Flight Radar and those type of websites, that's how these are built. People contribute to those central sites. So I'm basically building my own Flight Radar. All of this source code is open if you want to contribute your data to our wrap mq instance just let me know um, and i'll send you a key to send that data in um, but effectively what we're doing here is at the start of this this is a big java application so i needed to create a java build pack in addition to my kind of flask build pack uh, and the ui is a kind of um, react js based so i needed a build pack for that as well so i've just been creating this new uh, build process to go through that and what I've effectively done is I've used the same base images, so the same kind of core, um, kind of bullseye and Ubuntu images. Uh, currently, I'm just using bullseye, and I'm taking the real applications um, and building a Java image around that. Now, what I've not done yet is I've not split these two apart, so I've not created a Java Spring Boot build pack image, which I am going to create in the next video. I'll run you through that um, and then separate that from the app. I'm just doing it in one for now as I work through, as you would do normally, you know, start with one Java app. Oh, actually, I want to reuse it. Let's split that apart. So I'll show you how to do that the next time. But basically, what we've got here is we've got a build pack that's running through. And if I quickly show you this content and skip to the end, there's a whole bunch of nonsense as it goes off and installs the correct version of Maven. Um, but effectively, what we end up with, we end up with a fat spring boot jar file which is just not just my app but also the uh, dependencies for it but what i'm then doing is i'm actually extracting from that fat jar uh, the dependencies and the reason for doing that there's a couple of good reasons for it one is that um, it effectively uses layers in kubernetes more efficiently so you've got Kind of a layer that doesn't change very often for your dependencies and then a later for your a layer for your classes obviously these are the wrong way around but don't worry about that um that will change when i build the final build pack um, and that just makes it more efficient so as your app changes instead of kubernetes having to download every layer with all the dependencies again just because one you know one liner in your apps change it'll just download the classes for your app so that's quite beneficial and it makes for quicker startup times as well. Um, but what it also enables you to do, and what we'll show in a later video, is externalizing those dependencies. So we're going to look at, you know, in the light of the log4j joys that all of us has had over the Christmas and New Year period, um, you know, how do I figure out where all my dependencies are? How do I manage that securely? How do I generate a software bill of material so I know where everything is? We'll go through that in future videos, and this is really the, the, the start of that. But effectively what this does is this gives me my um, Java image and what this is it's a message driven app so it uses uh, kind of spring streaming uh, and consumes messages from a RabbitMQ instance it will then process those messages which are basically one message per aircraft location update from all of my uh, ground stations and it will process that into the current position uh, in redis 
um, of each aircraft. Uh, and the great thing about Redis is you can put a time to live on each data entry. So if you don't get a future message for that aircraft, because it's gone out of range, hopefully gone out of range and not crashed, burned and died. Uh, but if it's gone out of range, um, then you want it to drop out of the database and therefore drop out the UI and the app. So that's why we're using Redis as the kind of live view there. I'll go through the full architecture of that app in a future video once we've got all the pieces together. But this is effectively a quite a simple, straightforward uh, Java app. And once it's finished, it publishes the application again to our Harbor repository. And as you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of these in here and we've now got our ADSB live processor Java. Um, and this is working. Um, and here we go, we've got our V1 image and here we see um, it's 253 megabytes approximately. Uh, and my scanning's running now. And as you can see, it's a pretty common set of vulnerabilities. I'm deliberately, I hasten to add, deliberately using slightly older software in all my images so that in a future video I can talk you through how to spot vulnerabilities, how to stop them getting into your systems, how to do image signing and make sure that nobody can change it on disk and all those good security things. So this is deliberate. I'm not just being rather cavalier with security. So the app I'm actually uh, building so, is uh, this application here. So this is a Java Spring Boot application, as I mentioned. Um, it's some older code, so I've not touched this code in a while. As you can see, it's got io.pivotal. You know, Pivotal was bought by VMware a couple of years ago, so it's quite old code. But I've not changed the code to get it to run on Kubernetes, and that's super important. Um, there's nothing here that's changed. The only thing I did change is I moved from application.properties to application.yaml, just because I was fed up of typing the same thing every time. Um, and what I've done is I've externalized this as I've done in previous um, apps as well. So there's some settings for this app that are always the same because that's how the app works. Well, there's some settings that will change depending on where I'm deploying it to and where I'm getting the security and the host names from. So here I have a profile in Spring called Kate. And effectively what I'm doing here is I'm saying there will be environment variables given to you when you launch this Java app with these names. And what I'm going to do later in my Kubernetes configuration, which I'll show in another future video, uh, I'm going to create a big Helm chart for this entire app and all the data services it relies on. So you can just deploy it in a one in a one, and that will use and inject these properties. So we'll talk about that in a future video as well. The only thing I had to change here really was the pom.xml file. I upgraded um, to the latest 2.1 release of Spring um, just to get around a, a few annoyances that I was in uh, having. And the only other change I did here was I uh, included the repackage goal um, automatically so I didn't have to mess around on the Maven command line. There was a, there was a few previous settings for that. So that's really all I've changed. Um, what you can do, and again, what I'll show in future is I'll show how to create a single parent POM file um, or dependency file so that you know all your developers in your organization rather than having to remember oh which version of spring are we using do we use that library or that library instead of doing that i'll have uh, a parent pom that they just include and it just gives them the dependencies they need for that type of application so that type of application templating makes developer lives a lot easier if there's a standard pattern the organization always uses um but i don't want to copy paste code everywhere and have slightly different versions of things used throughout my entire code base um, so that's a good way of avoiding that. So once I've got that file, I checked it in and I linked to that for my build script. So you remember from before, there was a concourse file here, which took kind of the Flask app and your base images and uh, went through and built out um, the the final app. Oh, sorry, went on and built out the uh, final application using these tasks. Um, well, what I've got here is a similar thing. So, um, in my uh, code repository. So I have a code repository here for my ADSB app. Now this, the way this is laid out, of course, as you saw from the code here, is that this is one Git repository with multiple Java and .NET apps in the same repository. Depending on how your organization works, if it's one app, you might have those kind of microservices all in one Git repo, uh, like this app, but if you're starting from kind of the noddy hello world exercise on the internet, you'll have a separate Git repository for every tiny little service. In real life, that doesn't generally happen. So you'll see both ways of how to do that on these videos. But going back to here, this is where that lives. I'm currently working on feature 23. So I'm linking to feature 23. Normally you just link that to whatever uh, is the standard branch for either develop or main. 
and then my base images uh, where the docker files describing how to build my apps are is at that repo just as before and then what i'm doing in my task is i've imagined you've got it build my live processor java image uh, in here using the app code and the base image code running the standard concourse oci build task so oci is just the format of a container image so it's how you describe uh, the layers within a container and what i'm doing here is i'm passing parameters in um, to this task anything with build arg at the beginning of it gets passed into the oci build task so if in your docker file here um, you've got something for example you know app folder or app jar file name you can override that um, in here by putting build underscore arg underscore before it and that passes into those parameters and this just basically says base it in the current directory which has got two subdirectories one called adsb app one called base images use the docker file that's all the way down there um, the folder for the app is this folder so it's a subfolder of my main git repository there and what I'm saying is this is what it gets built. You could uh, put kind of target slash star dot jar if you're feeling brave. What I'm also doing here is I'm actually dynamically passing in the version of Maven too. Now what I could do is I could make that static as part of all of my Docker files, or I could make that dynamic. It's entirely down to how your organization wants to control your build process. Um, if you're doing this though, do make sure at the moment I'm not you know, I'm downloading that version of Maven. I'm not checking the SHA hash of that file. You want to do that. Um, I'll show how to do that in a future video. And then what I'm doing here is I'm passing in the, the main class that gets packaged into uh, that build so that the tests can run uh, as well. Um, and should that work, what we end up with, we end up with a Docker file that's published to that location. Uh, looking in the docker file then i've done a multi-stage build as before i'm basing it on kind of one of the open jdk images again this is a parameter so that i can customize that in my um build but the idea being that there's sensible configuration in here so it should always run obviously sometimes every app's going to be different for this thing but otherwise it should generally run without those parameters just to make it easier um, in the build phase then I'm using these particular arguments you must remember to do arg and then the name of the argument if the arg is specified at the top of the file otherwise it doesn't get passed um, into this uh, this particular build stage this one will always get passed in but below that you won't get these passed in and you wonder why it's a blank value um, what I'm doing here is I'm updating um, the particular uh, packages that are in that Linux, um, updating curl, tar and bash because I'm then using those to go and fetch the latest version or a particular named version of Maven and unpacking that and installing Maven. Uh, what Maven is for people who aren't familiar, there's Maven and Gradle, are the two main uh, kind of dependency management tools or build systems if you want to call them like that, uh, or packaging systems um, for Java based apps and Kotlin based apps. Um, Gradle will also use kind of Maven repositories as the source for its dependencies. It's just got a different way of running the build system. But here, this particular app was already using Maven, so I've just created a Maven set of images. What I'm doing here is I'm creating a, a .m2 Maven uh, cache location just to keep the cache for Maven separate from the final image because I don't want to inject a whole bunch of temporary uh, rubbish into that particular final image passing in some sensible options there. And then in the uh, kind of, uh, in here, what I'm then doing is running my Maven clean in package. That package command, because of the pom.xml file change, also runs the spring boot repackage. Otherwise you'd have to put that in here, uh, as we mentioned in this comment. And then what I'm doing is once I've built that big jar, fat jar file is I'm then unpacking that jar file to build my multiple layers. Uh, so then I'm defining my runtime and I'm saying, okay, I want the main class arg. But what I'm doing is I want to copy the classes, which is my apps classes, the libraries, which are the dependencies and the meta information. Um, and I want to copy those over into the runtime image. So that gives me the layers. Um, really, this class one should be the last layer because that's the one that's most likely to change. 
Uh, what I'm then doing is injecting this runtime configuration, Spring Profile, which it will get from, and Port, which it will get from kind of the Kubernetes or Helm definition. Um, and then I'm passing in run main class. Now, what I could do, as people are probably shouting at the YouTube video now, is there's a manifest.mf file within uh, this metainf, which has the uh, the kind of this kind of entry, which is a start class. I've not extracted that yet. I could do that with grep. i not got around to doing that yet. Um, but this is effectively a multi-stage build in one Docker file, which is slightly different from how I set up the Flask app, which was where I created an image for Flask and Jar, you know, Flask and Python for that particular operating system, and then use that image. This is all in one image. So I'm going to split that out in future. What this then gives me is it will then generate me my Docker image, and it works very, very well as you've seen. So yeah, that that's basically it. Um, these demonstrations are available on uh, kind of Adam Fowler UK on GitHub. So the paving will uh, currently on feature five I'm working on. I'll check that in later today. Um, this is where I have my kind of Kubernetes level um, kind of scripts. So this particular one will have things in for concourse configuration to go and do things. And then I've got another repository, which is like my build packs and my Docker files which is things used to generate images. Uh, and I try and keep them separate because you can imagine these are in different stages. So I might update my kind of concourse CD task to then use a slightly different Docker file or different version. Um, so they need to be in separate repositories for that reason. Um, but that's what we're building. So yeah, hopefully that was a kind of useful insight today into the Java build pack. What I'm going to do is I'm going to separate that out in a future video and then I'll run you through embedding kind of these ADSB, you know, this Java build pack as part of the kind of general pipeline. So you'll see multiple operating systems and multiple app runtimes all built um, alongside each other, which then gives me a set of build packs that my developers can then go and use with minimal configuration, minimal hassle, and they don't really need to know how Kubernetes runs. So hopefully that was a useful video, and in future we'll cover um, more advanced topics. But uh, if you like it, please do subscribe to my channel um, and put some comments in and let me know what you want to see in future. Thank you for your time.